Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Paramount Airways. Founded in July 1986, Paramount Airways would be one of several new charter airlines to form up during the mid-1980s, alongside Air 2000, Air UK Leisure and Airways International Cymru. The latter sounds rather familiar though. Unlike Air 2000 and Air UK, Paramount was purely an independent airline rather than operating as an in-house carrier to a parent tour operator. The airline would have its headquarters on site at Bristol Airport, which at the time was still known as Bristol Lullsgate Airport after the adjacent village of Lullsgate Bottom, not to be confused with Crinkley Bottom, which is where Mr Blobby lives. Fun fact, when I started my flying career I was based at Bristol and lived in Lullsgate Bottom. My house was so close to the airport that I could walk to work and only have to cross one main road. We were actually so close that I could leave my back garden straight into the field which, had it not been for the A38 passing through, would go right up to the runway approach lights, and I fear I've already gone completely astray barely two minutes in. Paramount's choice of equipment was the new McDonnell Douglas MD83, the 172-seat super-stretched Douglas DC-9. The MD-83 entered service in 1985, however Douglas had so far failed to get the new type into the UK market. To be fair, they'd previously struggled to get the DC-9 into the UK market, with only British Midland being the airline to choose it over the homegrown BAC-111. The MD-83 was of course much bigger than these older DC-9s and BAC-111s, but it was still a tough aircraft to sell. The sales department over in St. Louis had an idea though and offered Paramount an offer that they couldn't refuse. In exchange for an exclusivity deal where Paramount would only take McDonnell Douglas aircraft, the airline would be offered the aircraft and support at a much lower price. Paramount happily signed a deal for two aircraft to be delivered the following year on seven year leases and at last McDonnell Douglas had got its newest aircraft into the UK market. The first aircraft, GPATA, was delivered several months later, towards the end of April 1987, and would be joined a week later by its sister aircraft, Tango Bravo. The arrival of these aircraft cemented Paramount as the first British operator of the type, a few months ahead of British Island Airways, who also signed on the dotted line, albeit without tying their hands with an exclusivity deal. After some crew training flights, Paramount would begin taking sun-seeking Brits away on holiday once commercial flights began that May. The first flights departed Bristol bound for Malaga and Tenerife, though I don't know which aircraft operated which flight. Paramount would serve the traditional summer holiday destinations, mainly around the Med including Mahon, Parma, Ibiza, Alicante, Malaga and Malta. The airline would also serve some Greek destinations with Corfu, Rhodes, Thessaloniki and Athens being served along with Larnaca and Paphos over in Cyprus. Both Gran Canaria and Tenerife would see year-round service as ideal winter sun destinations. Despite having just two aircraft, Paramount would operate flights from other UK airports during the summer of 1987. Cardiff, Birmingham and London Gatwick all saw visits from the Paramount Mad Dogs. The airline was operating flights for both independent tour operators as well as larger established ones. Some even had their own airlines themselves such as owners abroad who despite having Air 2000 would use Paramount to help themselves establish routes ahead of their own expansion. Paramount had a good first summer and the MD-83s had proven very popular with passengers and crews alike. The 2x3 seating arrangement was particularly popular with passengers when compared to the more common free abreast arrangement found on the 737 and new 757s. With the aircraft's engines being located on the fuselage towards the rear of the aircraft, it made the cabin fairly quiet compared to other aircraft too. Well, except the rear cabin of course. The Mad Dogs were so well liked that Paramount signed a deal on two further aircraft for delivery in spring 1988. Meanwhile, the airline had plans for the winter of 1987. Paramount, like most charter airlines, ran a reduced schedule over the winter. The Canary Islands would be their primary destination thanks to their great year-round weather, but Paramount did something else too. The airline began operating the MD-83 on flights from the UK to India, with a once-a-week flight from London Gatwick to Goa. The MD-83 of course didn't have the legs to operate this route non-stop and would instead operate via Egypt, the United Arab Emirates and finally Oman before the last leg over the Arabian Sea to Goa. It was certainly something different and no doubt the longest route operated anywhere by the type, 
but the 2x3 seating configuration would have made it somewhat comfier for passengers compared to doing it on the Boeing 757 with its more densely packed 6 abreast cabin. Paramount was also operating some flights on behalf of British Airways out of London Heathrow and had also secured a contract with a German tour operator to operate some charter flights out of West Germany during the winter. These flights, combined with their own reduced programme and the India flights, meant that Paramount were really getting some use out of its aircraft during that winter season. The spring of 1988 saw the arrival of the next two MD-83s, Tango Charlie and Tango Delta, and brought the Paramount fleet to four aircraft. New UK departure points were added too during the year with Belfast, Exeter and Newcastle seeing service from Paramount. Things were really looking up for the airline. It had four new MD-83s and along with Air 2000 was operating the youngest fleet of any UK charter airline at the time. Paramount, unlike other UK airlines, was a non-smoking airline. Back then, airlines still had a smoking section at the rear of the aircraft well into the 1990s. Just like nowadays, enforcing the rule could cause some problems, and in the case of Mrs Maureen Harkavy, her insistence at continuing to smoke a cigarette during one flight resulted in the aircraft's commander paying her a visit. According to her, he said, Put that cigarette out or I'll land the plane and have you arrested. Before anyone thinks this is OTT, she had already been asked by one of the cabin crew and then warned by the cabin crew. Anyway, the 47-year-old was somewhat upset by this and complained to Paramount's chairman, John Faraday, who had little sympathy and replied, You seem to think you have a God-given right to pollute your neighbour's atmosphere. Mrs Harkavy was, shall we say, displeased by this reply and contacted the media to share her story, whilst also admitting that, I only found out about it when I was checking in. I'm a nervous flyer, so I lit a cigarette during the flight. A stewardess asked me to put it out, but I said that I wanted to carry on as there was no rule against smoking on the plane. She says that she found out about the rule at check-in, but then says there was no rule when confronted about it by cabin crew. Well done, Mrs Harkavy. I wonder what Judge Rinder would make of that defence. Smoking hijinks aside, it was another very good summer for Paramount. The four MD-83s were getting great utilisation and the airline was looking ahead at further expansion. Unfortunately for them, there was one small problem. The exclusivity deal with McDonnell Douglas tied them to that manufacturer and Paramount needed something made away from Long Beach. At the time, McDonnell Douglas offered the MD-80 series narrowbody and the DC-10 and MD-11 widebody with nothing in the middle. The MD-80 was quite long, especially compared to the Boeing 737 or new to market Airbus A320, and the length of the MD-80 resulted in a bit of a headache for Paramount. The airline wanted to secure contracts to serve several Greek islands. The problem was that these island airports generally didn't have much by way of taxiways, and instead required aircraft to taxi onto the runway, then backtrack to the end and turn around for takeoff, or, in the case of landing, do it the other way around. The problem here was that the MD-83's turning circle was larger than that of the 737, A320 or even the older DC-9's that it was based on. Without modifying the airport facilities, the Mad Dogs could find themselves stuck. Though it's worth noting that over the years the airports have had work done and the MD-80's have been visiting the islands for years without problems. Well, except that one time at Skiafos, but that's a long story. Paramount, with its eyes on the Boeing 737, found a clever workaround to get what it wanted without breaching the contract it had with the folks in St. Louis. In October 1988, Paramount acquired the Cardiff-based Amber Airways. As covered in the previous episode, Amber had risen from the ashes of Airways International Cymru, which had collapsed earlier in the year. Amber had two Boeing 737-200s, and as far as Paramount were concerned, they would do nicely. One of the 737s, GBKMS, was quickly sent over to Hong Kong to join the new startup airline Dragonair on a winter lease. The second, GBOSA, the former Airways International bird, wouldn't see service with Paramount, however. After spending several months parked up at Bristol Airport, it was ferried to Luton, where it remained until joining Servicios Aerolíneas Mexicanas in 1994. That 737 found itself in the midst of a legal battle between the leasing company, Havilert Leasing, and their own creditors, with the leasing company moving it to a shell company to evade impoundment as they themselves were facing bankruptcy. Fortunately for Paramount, they were able to drop the aircraft and avoid getting tangled up in the legal fight that ensued. Sierra Alpha wasn't the only aircraft to depart the Paramount fleet. 
Despite pretty much being brand new, one of the MD-83s, Tango Charlie, was returned to the lesser after just eight months with the airline. Reports are that this particular bird was a bit of a hanger queen resulting in costly subcharters. She probably rolled off the production line on a Friday afternoon. Despite the loss of the two aircraft, Paramount were undeterred and had plans for 1989. The other 737, Mike Sierra, returned from Dragonair in April and was quickly repainted out of the hybrid Amber Air livery and into a plain white livery with Paramount titles. It wouldn't be the only 737 to operate for Paramount though, as the airline picked up a brand new 737-300 which was delivered in June. This too would wear an all-white livery. Surely it wasn't that difficult to paint the red and blue stripe, or maybe it was deemed too expensive, just like when Airways International couldn't afford to repaint its aircraft either. Since the airline had withdrawn two aircraft, they found themselves short of metal whilst waiting for their new 737 to arrive. Much to the delight of plane spotters across the country, Paramount was able to source some exotic aircraft to operate flights on their behalf. MEA, or Middle East Airlines from Lebanon, operated a pair of Boeing 707s from Newcastle. These had a full complement of MEA crew, with a Paramount rep along for the ride. Bristol and Birmingham would also see some 707 action, with one aircraft being operated by Skibi Airlines of Zaire. The other, sporting an unbranded Air Mauritius livery, was owned by Omega Air, but had been subleased to various airlines during the mid to late 80s and gave me quite a headache working out who was actually operating it at the time. These were not the first 707s to be brought in by Paramount, however. The airline had been forced to bring in one from Air Seychelles during the summer of 1988. This was due to problems with one of their MD-83s. No point for guessing which one. American Transair would also operate a Boeing 727 on behalf of Paramount with the aircraft operating out of London, Gatwick, Manchester and Birmingham. Unlike the 707s which were all short term, the 727 was expected to stay for the busy summer season. While it would retain its ATA livery, it did at least sport Paramount titles. The airline's shiny new Boeing 737-300 GPATE was delivered in June 1989 and as previously mentioned wore an all-white livery with just basic Paramount titles. On the surface everything seemed to be on the up and up for the airline. Its new 737 had been introduced without any major hiccups and the airline had secured contracts for more flights from Germany over the winter. Unfortunately, the seeds of the airline's destruction had, unbeknownst to them, already been sown. In July 1989, the Serious Fraud Office came knocking on Paramount's door. They were conducting an investigation into the disappearance of several million pounds from the Eagle Trust. The Eagle Trust was what you could consider a conglomerate, and had interests in everything from manufacturing and construction to television production and parcel delivery. The key part of this story is that the man in charge of the Eagle Trust was Paramount's own chairman, John Faraday. Now, I'm going to be very honest here. The legal mess surrounding Faraday and the Eagle Trust is quite frankly mind-boggling. If I was somehow able to get my head around the whole affair, this video would end up being two hours long. The short version is that Faraday ran the Eagle Trust like an autocracy. Oh, how about this? In his own words, everybody keeps describing Eagle as a public company. It's a much more special animal than that. It was a bull market phenomenon. It was a personality cult phenomenon. I was Eagle Trust. That was a quote from an interview conducted with newspapers after he had absconded when the SFO came looking for him. Over the previous two years, Faraday had siphoned funds from the Eagle Trust through its subsidiary companies to the tune of around £13.5 million. According to him, it was to save Eagle's takeover of another firm which was in danger of falling through. What happened was Eagle was on the verge of acquiring the Samuelson Group just as the Black Monday crash occurred. In an attempt at salvaging the deal, some interest in accounting went on, but before one thinks that he was doing this solely for the company, he was eventually convicted of stealing £250,000, which went towards a new house for him and his wife. The rabbit hole gets even deeper though, as Faraday had tried to arrange a takeover of an American airline by Paramount. The airline in question was Sunworld, the very same one that had subleased a 737 to Airways International Cymru a few years earlier. The takeover talks came to nothing, however, with the financially struggling Sunworld ceasing operations towards the end of 1988. In the words of Ron Paul Peel, but wait, there's more. Faraday was also involved in the potential sale of Paranporth Aerodrome, a small former World War II airfield. 
He had also allegedly sold 51% of Paramount to a chap named Mario Berry for just £1, though it seemed that the latter was just smoke and mirrors, as Berry didn't make any changes, not that it would matter. It was August when things started to unravel for Paramount. The authorities were digging deeper and deeper into the financial circumstances around the Eagle Trust and Faraday had fled the country. On Monday the 7th of August 1989 an administration order was filed against Paramount Airways. The airline had been declared insolvent with over £11 million pounds owed to its creditors. Unusually, the administration order had been filed by two of the country's largest tour operators, the Owners Abroad Group and the International Leisure Group. Both companies had their own in-house airlines, Air 2000 and Air Europe, though the filing wasn't an attempt at removing competition. Both companies actually used Paramount to transport their own customers and their action was born more out of a concern of whether or not Paramount could continue operating. According to the Owners Abroad chairman, the group was due to make very substantial payments to Paramount in respect of its flying commitments for the remainder of the summer season. He added that the board was advised that Paramount was unable to pay its liabilities in full and that in order for it to continue to trade and to honour passengers bookings throughout the summer season an immediate application for an administration order should be made. Several thousand OAG and ILG holidaymakers were already abroad and over a hundred thousand more had booked and paid for holidays which involved flying on Paramount's aircraft. Both owners abroad and the International Leisure Group agreed to support Paramount through the administration. In other words, they agreed to fund the airline's operation throughout the summer season rather than have the airline cease operations immediately. The American Transair 727 was stood down with passengers being filtered onto existing flights with other carriers and thus helped reduce costs. The three MD-83s and two 737s continued to operate during the remainder of the summer while the administrators looked at selling Paramount as a going concern. There were several parties interested in acquiring the airline, one of which was a consortium of Paramount's management and staff. As the summer drew to a close, the airline looked beyond administration and planned ahead for the quiet winter season. One of the MD-83s was set to operate weekend charter flights from Germany again, and both 737s were lined up with winter-long leases. The 737-200, Mike Sierra, was set to head back over to Hong Kong and join Dragonair for another winter. This time around, it would be painted into the full Dragonair livery. The 737-300 would be going even further, to Australia where it would be used as a strike breaker by ANSET Australia during the then ongoing national pilots dispute. By the middle of October 1989, the administrators had formed the view that there was a real prospect of selling Paramount on the terms that would be beneficial to the general body of the airline's creditors. On the 30th of October 1989, a meeting took place between representatives of four airports, including Bristol and Birmingham, where an understanding was reached that none of them would exercise any power of detention until after the creditors' meeting on the 3rd of November 1989. Unfortunately for Paramount, Bristol Airport had become nervous that the aircraft might leave and not return, so obtained a court order on Tuesday the 2nd of November to impound Paramount's aircraft. That afternoon, Birmingham Airport learned of Bristol's actions and immediately and without court order impounded Tango Alpha by parking a lorry in front of the MD-83. That aircraft had been due to leave that afternoon for Germany and the first the airline heard of it was when the flight crew arrived and was handed a lien notice. Despite the actions of both Bristol and Birmingham airports, the planned meeting took place the next day where an offer for Paramount's business and assets was put forward by the administrators. The airline's creditors, including Bristol and Birmingham airports, agreed in principle to the sale and acknowledged that the proposed sale would collapse if they continued to detain some of the fleet. It took well over a week, including a three-day hearing before the judge ruled against the airports. Naturally, both airports appealed, and the appeal court ruled that the aircraft could remain impounded until the hearing set at the end of November. After Paramount shelled out a £350,000 bond, the aircraft were released on the 14th of November. The damage was done, however, and Paramount was grounded, permanently. So, what went wrong? Well, it's an odd one, really. The way I see it is that the blame lies with three parties, the former chairman, John Faraday, and both Bristol and Birmingham airports. Faraday's actions at Paramount and the Eagle Trust caused the downfall of the airline, there's no doubt about that. The actions of the two airports, however, Bristol and Birmingham, are what sealed the airline's fate. There had been hope that Paramount could be saved. 
Unlike other British airlines in the same situation, it had operated during its administration and had found a potential buyer, though both airports were right to be concerned. Should the aircraft have departed, then they would have had no leverage with which to recoup what they were owed. Bristol obtained a court order. Birmingham, however, did not, instead acting in contempt of court and impounding the aircraft without prior authorization in the hope of obtaining it later. The fact that both airport authorities had been present during the meetings with the airline and its administrators and had supported the proposed sale made their actions a complete stab in the back. The bankruptcy judge quite rightly pointed out that both Bristol and Birmingham airports had benefited greatly from the continued operation of the airline and subsequent payments of fees. He also acknowledged that on the day Paramount went into administration, none of the airline's aircraft were at either airport, and that had the airline ceased trading that day, as unsecured creditors they would have received little to nothing in payment. The Paramount story has had more legal battles than any other airline I've covered. There was the legal bullet dodged regarding one of the former Amber Air 737s and the Eagle Trust debacle. The legal battle between the administrators and the airports was covered in Bristol Airport PLC vs Powdrill, and that really opened the can of worms that is Airlines and the Insolvency Act. Then there was a legal case brought on by some Paramount pilots who sued the administrators because they continued to run the airline and in the pilot's eyes had adopted their contracts in full and that they were due their accrued pay and benefits. That legal battle went on until 1994. They won, and the repercussions for folks made redundant were enormous, so naturally, the government intervened and changed legislation. OK, I'm fed up with all the legal cases. Anything else to add before I watch something else? Well, yes, a few things. John Faraday eventually returned to the UK, and in 1993 was sentenced to six years in prison following a ten-month-long trial. The Eagle Trust, with debts of over £100 million, was eventually broken up and sold off, with any unsold businesses being liquidated in 1997. This isn't quite the end of the story, however. Paramount had a business jet operator, Paramount Executive, which was based in Birmingham and operated a pair of Cessna C550 Citations, G, BHTT and GJFRS. Paramount Executive was spared the administration proceedings and was sold off as a going concern, eventually becoming Eurojet, one of the country's leading private jet operators until they went bust in 2014. I think that just about wraps this one up. I've gone on all this time to talk about an airline which operated for barely over two years. I hope the next episode is a lot lighter, but I'm not holding my breath. Joking aside, I really hope you've enjoyed this episode and would like to express my gratitude to some folks on Facebook who were able to fill in some blanks for me or otherwise clear up some confusion. If you've got any comments, suggestions or criticism, then please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry, I've got a contact form on my website and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I have plenty more episodes in the works, including some special ones, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.